<laughs> Let's pray. Let's pray, and then we'll get into it. All right? Let's do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, despite the struggles and challenges that we faced all day, anytime leading up to this today, Lord, that you led each and every person that's participating with us tonight and these two wonderful people to be here with me this evening. I pray that you'll uh, send your Holy Spirit down to open our minds, soften our hearts, help those who need to hear something tonight, each and every one of us to hear something that will really change our, our outlook and our attitude towards our relationship with you, and really our outlook and attitude towards our relationship with fitness and how that ties in with our relationship with you um, and our emotions and our, you know, the mindset that we have around those things, that we can really be open to new ways of thinking and new ways of um, just pursuing you with all that we have and removing anything, any obstacle that stands in between us and the person that you're calling us to be and ultimately our sainthood and, and our time with you in heaven. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Great. So uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit here at the beginning was just seeking excellence. So you guys know that we just launched the, the blog and website and everything last week, uh, which is super exciting. <laughs> Uh, but we just wanted to, I, I, the reason why I want to talk about that tonight is, is to kind of give some context for why I chose Josie and Father Chase. So despite the, despite the technical difficulties, still very glad that I got my man Father Chase. Dude, let's just leave that behind. Let's just get on with the interview, bro. Like, this is <laughs> right. about the people. It's not right. about me. You're right. That was my last time. I had one more. Let's, talk, was, let's just talk to Josie. What do you want me to do? I had one more. I had to get Dude. it out. It's out now. It's in the past. It's in the past. Like confession. <laughs> so so anyways so seeking excellence our kind of our philosophy with that is that you know we're we're made for you know to know love and serve god and we found that in our lives the things that get in the way of us and the path that jesus has laid out before us is oftentimes things that have to do with you know mental emotional physical and financial and so we seek to really teach people the, the fundamentals and the the importance of those different aspects of life, you know, so whether it's your mental health or leadership or your relationships or uh, fitness and nutrition and all these different things, you know, getting on a sound budget that can give you peace of mind with you just being a good steward in your life. Um, that's, that's our goal, right? That's our mission. That's our philosophy. So we're really striving to do that. And so I, I try to bring people on to things like this or in our, our blog that we have and um, our guest contributors that are going to be, you know, helping us with that as well. People that, you know, really uh, just embody that, embody that philosophy. And so Josie and Father Chase are, are two of those people, you know, two of the best people that I know that embody those things and just have incredible stories um, that I'm really excited to get to share with you tonight because they both, you know, just, just are, are individuals who are really, really pursuing God's calling on their life with all that they have. And before that, um, pursued athletics with all that they had. And I mean, we're still pursuing God, obviously, back then as well, but um, just really understand how much uh, fitness and pushing yourself, uh, you know, mind, body, and spirit can impact your relationship with God and how you can carry over some of that, you know, work ethic and things that you learn about yourself into the spiritual life and into that, into that chase with God. So uh, really, really pumped to have you guys tonight. So uh, let's go with Josie first. We're going to give Father Chase a break and we'll have Josie, if you would, if you would, please share some of your story and stuff for, for people to hear a little bit more about you and um, where you come from and just, yeah, your tale. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Nathan. It's super exciting to be here. Um, yeah, as Nathan said, I'm Josie. Um, I guess to kind of start back in the beginning, um, I'm from Florida. To give you a little background, uh, born and raised in a big Catholic family. So I'm the sixth of seven kids. I have five older brothers and a little sister. Um, and we all grew up as athletes. Um, two wonderful parents who are practically saints, um, raised us all in the faith and just always had this blend of faith and sports. Um, you know, all my siblings played collegiate basketball and I decided, I guess, to be different. Um, I played tennis, but um, growing up, we just always knew that we were playing sports to glorify the Lord. Like that's what our parents taught us. So kind of pursuing athletics with that mindset of like, it's not the most important thing. God should be number one, right? And so when I was about like 10 or 11, I had started playing pretty competitively. And at that point, I decided like I was going to be a professional tennis player. I know, very ambitious 11 year old. But, <laughs> anyways, I, um, I'm the type of person that, you know, when I, you know, 
put a goal in my head or a dream, like I'm going to do it. Gosh, darn it. Like, even if I die trying. Um, so like, honestly, from that point on, from like 11 to like a year ago, so 13 years of my life, um, I kind of that dream of pursuing professional tennis kind of, um, I guess, formed a lot of the decisions that I made. So I was homeschooled in high school to pursue that dream and play more tournaments. I specifically chose to go to college at the University of Florida because they had one of the best uh, collegiate programs in the nation. Um, and I, I was blessed to have an incredible collegiate career that was highlighted by a national championship my junior year and really left with some wonderful memories and just, um, yeah, the time there, I, I, it was the best of my life. Um, but I guess when I graduated in May 2018, um, I was just super excited because I finally had this chance to wholeheartedly pursue my dream that I had for the last 13 years of my life, you know, since I was 11 years old, like now is the time I could finally pursue that. Um, so that was two years ago. I was graduating college, ready to pursue this dream that I had on my heart. Um, and I think it's really, really funny kind of how God works and how his will kind of manifests itself in our lives if we're listening. Um, because it was only about six, nine months into pursuing this dream of mine and um, that, I've all, that I thought I always wanted that God showed me pretty quickly that uh, it actually wasn't what he wanted for me. Um, and I'll kind of bring you to that point where I, it all kind of all came together and I realized um, that he might be asking me to step away. And it's kind of ironic and funny, but it was like at a high point in my career, right? So I was, it was October of 2018. So only about five months into playing pro. Um, I was actually in Greece of all places playing like a month long swing of tournaments. And um, I had just gotten to the semis of the first tournament, like playing great. Uh, my parents were there, like living the dream. I was on like some resort in Greece, like by the beach and some tennis courts. I'm like, this is the life. Like <laughs> it doesn't get much better than this. Right. Um, but I knew something was wrong because uh, even though I was having so much fun living my dream, like I would still come back to my hotel room at night and just have this like sinking feeling on my heart. Like, is this, is this all there is, you know? Um, and I was super frustrated because I was like, God, like, why can't you just give this to me? Like, I, I love doing this. I love playing tennis. Like, why can't this, you just, why can't I be happy and at peace doing this? Um, and I just knew that like, if I was doing, truly doing the Lord's will for my life, I wouldn't feel like that. You know, I, I have a sense of peace. Um, and at the same time that I was pursuing this dream and just, it had been a growing desire on my heart to do something more. You know, my faith has had always been an integral part of my, my life, but, um, in, for the last like 13 years I had pursued tennis, but now I, I kind of realized that I had a lot of other gifts and talents and I just wanted to use them to practically serve the Lord and other people. Um, you know, tennis can be a very, I mean, it is a very selfish sport. There's just one person. Um, so like, it's very focused on you, your tournaments, your travel, your training. And I just wanted to do something for other people for once and serve the church in a bigger way. Um, so coming home from Greece, I realized like I, I had a big decision to make. Um, I kind of knew God was calling me away from uh, professional tennis, but I was scared, you know? Um, so, so I asked God, I was like, okay, God, like I kind of made a deal with him. I was like, you know what, if, if you want me to walk away from tennis, like you're going to have to make it abundantly clear. Like you're going to have to just drop a job into my lap. Right. Um, I'll, I'll give you the option. So I'm going to like apply to things and, you know, look for jobs at Catholic institutions because like, I don't know what to do other than tennis, but, um, you know, if you want me to do something else, you make it happen. So I was like, okay, I'll just keep playing tennis, whatever. Um, well, never tell God to do that unless you want something to happen. Because it was like a couple months later, January, um, and lo and behold, I like a job from the University of Notre Dame kind of falls into my lap. I mean, I had applied and stuff, but I was not trying to get the job and it just kind of came and I was like, dang it. I like specifically remember 
calling a friend and um, crying on the phone because I had gotten the job. But (laughs) um, so, you know, I get this job and I realize, okay, God's opening a door for me. I had asked for him to open a door for me if, if he wanted to lead me away from tennis, but I was scared and I wasn't ready to leave tennis behind. You know, I had all these questions on my heart. Um, like, who am I without tennis? You know, what will people think of me? Will I be labeled a quitter? Um, you know, what if I regret it? Because honestly, the best years of my career were still in front of me. There was so much I could still do and so much potential that I had. Um, and I was just scared of that. So I had the choice to, you know, step into the unknown um, and take a leap of faith and just trust God would, would lead me where he want me to go. Or I could continue to pursue this dream stubbornly without peace. Um, so I, I jumped, I just went for it. (laughs) Full send. (laughs) I uh, moved up to Indiana to South Bend in the middle of winter in February last year, Florida girl. Um, I bought my first winter coat. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and yeah, started, started a totally different, like my life changed 180 from pro athlete to normal girl at a desk job. Um, but you know, and to be honest, like this is a year and I don't know, like three months later, and I'm still trying to figure out what the specific mission that God's calling me to ap- after tennis, right? Um, but God's really showed me like, that's okay, you know, because um, I think the world like tells us that we should always have this huge dream or this huge goal. And for my whole life, like I had that with tennis and I love having a goal to work towards. And I wish I knew what God wanted for me right now. So I could have that goal and that dream, but I don't. And that's okay though, because I think there's a lot of us out there like that. Um, and I've, cause I've learned that like any plans that we make, you know, we have, we have to cling to them lightly because, and give God permission to reroute us along the way. Um, and I've learned just like a hundred percent. Okay. Not to have the next 10, five, year of your life figured out and because all that's entrusted to you is today um and god will provide for tomorrow each step of the way um and lead us closer to his will so i guess that's kind of like where i am now and um kind of just taking it one step at a time and where god's leading me but um i guess through all of this i think the number one thing that god's kind of really taught me is to cling to him over any plans that I have because he is my rock. Um, he's my only hope in my joy. So I have to trust him and his providence over any plans. Um, so yeah, that's me in a nutshell, I guess I could keep talking, but. <laughs> that is awesome. No, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think, uh, yeah, it really gives people a good insight to your story. I remember my first time hearing it. And it's, uh, yeah, definitely inspirational. I think it is great to hear your trust in the Lord as you stepped out, you know, something that you had been shooting for. I mean, you said, what, age 11, right? You decided you were going to be a pro tennis player and then to actually do yep. it. And it bounced from that. I mean, it's awesome. So, uh, yeah, we'll talk more about your ministry and stuff. You know, I'm excited yeah. to get that later too. But Father Chase, my man, we go back all the way to when I used to have to give you buckets at, at the mount in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so Father Chase, for those of you who don't know, he was at the Mount St. Mary's Seminary when I was a student at Mount St. Mary's. And so we go, I mean, you left my junior year. It was your deacon year. And uh, yeah, you graduated. So we had three years there together, but... Uh, would you like to share, please, your, a little bit of your, st- your story and how you got here today? Yeah, you know, just, just hearing Josie talk, you know, it's, it's amazing how, how similar our stories are. And, and that we shared, you know, the other day, just, just catching up and, and preparing for the show. But, um, yeah, I'll say, you know, I grew up also with a, in a faithful Catholic family. My parents were, were adamant about, about us practicing our faith. And, and, of course, you know, as, as, as young kids, my brother and I, his name is Blaze, he and I were just natural athletes. My parents were natural athletes. Um, and so we, we all love sports. It was just kind of a family thing. It was just what we did together. Um, and of course, growing up in Illinois, um, you know, I watched the, the six Bulls championships. So this, this, this whole last dance thing that's going on right now is like a replaying of my childhood and, and, and watching, um, you know, all those things that I, that I lived for. And I actually thought, you know, Michael Jordan at that time, although I played soccer, my history is in soccer. My, my favorite sport at the time was basketball. And I think if I could have made it in basketball, that would have been the, the sport that I would have chosen. But um, being 5'9 and you can't dunk and, you know, and whatever else, there's, there's just no chance, you know. So 
Um, but it ended up, Blaze and I were, were both uh, really good soccer players and, and ended up, you know, realizing that maybe we have a future in this. And, and so uh, he and I both played uh, Division One soccer. Blaze went to Butler University a year before I did. I went to Clemson University um, just a, a few years later. Like Josie said, you know, like I, I always dreamed of, of, for me, for soccer, I, I wanted to play in the ACC. Um, and that is, that is the soccer conference in the country. And so if I thought if I ever had a chance, and I had two opportunities, I, I could have played at Wake or, at, or at, um, at Clemson, and I chose to go to Clemson. And um, one of the best decisions I ever made. And, and uh, having said that, just being there at Clemson, it was one of those times that, you know, my freshman year of college, I tell the students here at the University of Illinois, where I'm currently a chaplain, you know, that um, in my freshman year, that was the, the most important decision that I ever made uh, in all of my life, even more so than being a priest. And the decision that I made was, you know, we get there and we realize we're, we're so independent. We're away from our families. Uh, we don't have to be woken up to go to mass in the morning anymore. There's, there's, there's so much for us to decide. And, and um, it was at that time that I actually chose to be a Christian. It was, it was at that time that I realized I was thinking about what kind of man am I supposed to be? And, and what kind of man am, am, do I want to be in this world? I didn't know all the answers to that right then. But I do know that, that you know, my father's example of, of being a Catholic and, and, and being a strong man, and I, I looked up to him, although I didn't tell him that, I, I looked up to him and, and um, it, was, it was then that I realized I, I want to be a Catholic, I want to be a Christian, I, I want to have God in my life in some way, I couldn't drop it off. And it was at that time that I really chose that, that I was going to practice my faith in some way. My struggle wasn't necessarily believing, but my struggle was, was living that out then. You know, and, and I struggled with that for a long time all, all throughout college, but, um, but certainly had, had some success in college. We were, you know, ranked in the top 10, um, you know, uh, pretty much all four years and, and um, went to the Elite Eight twice, never got over the hump to, to get to that national championship, but, um, but had good success there. And, and, and because of that, had opportunities to play professionally. And, and ultimately, I had an opportunity to, to go overseas, which is, uh, you know, an American soccer player's dream is, is, is to play overseas. And so I had the opportunity to go down to South America. I played in Chile for, ended up being for four years. I didn't know how long I would be there, but um, I had some success and, and, and was able to, um, to live out my dream there and, and, and to play. And really, what would happen with my vocation, you know, I, I didn't really feel um, called or I didn't know I was being called to the priesthood until I moved to Chile, until I was actually embracing kind of the greatness that I had dreamed for myself, living that Michael Jordan moment that, that I thought I was living in my mind. And, and it was when I got there and, and I embraced the silence of life, something I didn't ask for and something I didn't want. It was not my merit, it wasn't my virtue. It was actually just what was imposed upon me, uh, this silence that I didn't know before. And, and I ended up going back to the only thing I know. And I think that's something that we have to remember. Um, that when, when we get in troubled situations in our life, the only thing that we have to do is to fall back on what we know. And the only thing that I knew at that time was in, in that country, I didn't know the language, I didn't know the customs, I didn't know people, I didn't have friends or family, I, did, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to get downtown on a bus. I couldn't do anything. Um, but the only things I did know is I knew soccer and I knew the Catholic Church. And those two things made me feel at home. Those are the two universals. You know, it's soccer is the universal game and, and the Catholic church is the universal church. That's what Catholic means. And so I, I would stop into Catholic churches, you know, after practice, a, a professional soccer player only, 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 only works for two hours a day, you know, and I didn't know what to do with 22 hours. And so I would start stopping at, at churches and I would, I would just start to, 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 tell God what was on my heart and I would I would complain and I would I would I would ask and I would I would beg and 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 I would I would do the best that I could and turns out that 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 actually was prayer I, I didn't know it at the time but that that was what that was what prayer is it's actually just speaking to the Lord from your heart and in one of those times you know I, I allowed the Lord I, I didn't know what I was doing but I just sat in silence and at that time I felt the Lord call me to priesthood I heard him say be my priest and, and that was just out of left field. It was something that I, I never expected, something I never wanted. And as I say, I did what any young man would do who's 22 years old, living his dream and running away from the priesthood. Um, I found the, the next best girl that I could find and I started dating her, you know? And uh, I, was, I was running and I, I ran from that for, for years and I continued to play soccer and, and, and had a great time. It ended up that um, I had success on the field. I, had, I, got, I basically received all the things that I asked for. The Lord was so good to me to grant me the things that I asked for so that he could show me that that's what did, wasn't what my heart was wanting, you know? And so I, I ended up having tons of friends. I ended up speaking Spanish fluently. 
I ended up dating a great girl uh, that I thought that, that I could fall in love with and, and maybe spend my life with. Um, everything went well. We won a championship. I, I had personal accolades. And it was the end of those four years after winning that championship and, and, and living there and, and, and thinking that I was on top of the world, my Michael Jordan moment, um, that I remember just, just at night, there was just another moment of grace in which I was just thanking the Lord saying, you know, Lord, like, finally, this is it. Like, finally, finally, I've arrived. Finally, I'm here. Like, this is it. And humanly speaking, I was as happy as I've ever been. And in the moment that I said, this is it, my heart sank. And it was like, just like, the, just like Josie said, it was like that emptiness. And I just, I just, I just said, wait, this is it. As confident as I was saying, this is it. I was, I was then questioning, wait, this is it. You know, at that time, 20, I'm 25 years old and that, and that's it. Like what else? There's a whole lot of life to live. I don't know if I'll ever win a championship again. I don't know if I'll ever have the opportunity to have success like this again. Like this is it. And I just couldn't understand that. And I realized at that moment, if I believe who God is, and if I believe he is who he says he is, and he promises what he promises is true, like he has a plan for my life. And that is going to lead me to, to the ultimate fulfillment of my life. Then maybe this call to the priesthood has something to it. I didn't make the decision to leave the game at that time, but I did make phone calls and I did start, start applying to the seminary and, and unbeknownst to everybody else, I was already uh, kind of moving and, and realizing that, that my life was going to change drastically. I ended up calling my agent, telling him I need to get back to the United States. Everybody thought that I wanted to cash in and come back and play in the United States. And, and it ended up, you know, I, I got to play a season in front of my friends and family, which is something that I dreamed of being back here in the MLS. I played for the New England Revolution. And, and it was there that, um, you know, I, at that time I had been accepted to the seminary and, and um, you know, mid-season, July 1st, uh, I, I asked to cash out and, and be done with my contract and, and ended up uh, going to Mount St. Mary Seminary where I met Nathan and um, started playing basketball again, got back to my first dream and uh, playing intramural basketball. But, <laughs> um, but I've been a priest now for uh, six years in the Diocese of Peoria in Illinois, currently the chaplain at the University of Illinois. And uh, man, it, th this really is the dream, you know, uh, following God's will. If we don't do God's will, you never live the dream. You, you just don't, you know, you can do whatever you want, but you're just grasping, you're just chasing. You're, 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 you're never going to get there. And, and we think that we have to arrive. Once you, once you arrive with Jesus, you realize that you've never arrived and, and you just got to live a relationship. It's, it's just about living life every single day. Amazing. Yo, you know, your story, your story is incredible, but I mean, super cool to hear you tell the full thing today. And, <laughs> uh, you know, something I was just thinking about while you were talking was like, you know, being a student at a school, the seminary, like you see all these guys come and a lot of them discern out or whatever, but mm -hmm. like, I mean, just to see you where you're supposed to be, like, if, I mean, legitimately, like, no, no overhype in this. Like, if there was one person, they were like, hey, who do you think will be a baller college chaplain? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Out of all the seminaries <laughs> you met in your life, I'm like, Yo, you got to send Father Chase to college. Like, he's got to be a college chaplain. So, I mean, yeah, it's just great to see the guys who, you know, obviously, I'm glad that those who discern out, if they're not meant to be there, they're not meant to be there. But, uh, yeah. Hey, man, just, thanks, for, thanks for making that call to my bishop, because he, he listened to you, man. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, I got yeah. the connection. Well, I my... got some other things I'd like you to talk to him about if you get a chance. Man. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll DM you, man. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, it should be a text. It should be a text. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's great. I mean, thank you guys both for sharing, sharing your stories there. So let's dive into some discussion questions now. There's some really, really good stuff that I really want to ask you guys and just kind of tying it all together, you know, these different pillars of excellence like we talked about. So uh, the first one I want to talk about is just kind of, Generally speaking, like, what do you feel like you really learned about yourself as a person? And then maybe like some of, if you want to tie into your spiritual life as well, like, what did you learn about the spiritual life through competition and pushing yourself physically and mentally in all these different ways? Like, what do you feel like you really learned about yourself as a, as an individual uh, through doing that and then pushing yourself to that, you know, such a high caliber for both of you? Josie, would you like to answer that first? Sure. Yeah. Um... I think for me, it's like with sports and with, uh, with anything you're pursuing wholeheartedly, like you're putting everything you have into it. So you're pushing yourself to the max. And I've learned that like our bodies can take way more than you think they can. Like it's all mental, right? Like half of sports is mental. Um, and that definitely translates to prayer life in the value of like suffering, right? Um, Cause in sports, like you get stronger, the more you endure, like in practices, when you push yourself to where you're about to pass out and I've like cramped up and like whatever, but you keep going, like 
that makes you stronger. So when you're in matches, you can, you can do, you know, you can go the full nine yards and play three sets or whatever, uh, four hours, whatever it might be. And in the spiritual life, um, you know, even with, with suffering and stuff, you know, the more you go through and the more you learn to trust the Lord and like surrender all to him and lean on him in hard times, it gives you confidence in him. So like when that happens again, you can do the same thing. Right. So it's like, it's all like practice. And I think, um, you know, the secret to holiness isn't really a secret. It's just discipline. Um, and I think that athletics really teaches you those fundamentals and those basics, um, of discipline that definitely translates into prayer life. Um, cause yeah, you just learn very quickly. Quitting is not an option. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's such a beautiful thing. I mean, to think about our spiritual life, you know, and I think it's one thing that I think, uh, I was really grateful for just some of my, you know, my training or whether it was sports or the army, like just thinking about the fact that one thing that I committed to early on, I feel like in my walk with God was like, I'm not going to leave. Like, and that's why Sunday mass was always so important for me. I felt like it could be my anchor in between everything, you know, no matter what was going on. I was like, if I go to Sunday mass, I commit, I will never not go to Sunday mass. If I can commit to that, then no matter what, no matter how far I feel like I drift or I fall away, I know that at least once a week, I'm going to be hit with that hard, cold reality of like who I should be, what I should be doing, you know, and I'm going to embrace that at least once a week for the rest of my life. And I think that that's been such a you know, anchored point for me to keep me from understanding that like quitting is not an option. Like there's no leaving, you know, mm-hmm. God, like, you know, John, John six, to whom should we go? Like, what am I supposed to, you know, where am I supposed to turn to? Mm-hmm. Um, if not, you know, if not to Jesus for the fulfillment and, and uh, you know, purpose of life, like to ex- actually experience joy. But Father Chase, what about for you? What do you feel like you've learned about yourself through pushing yourself so hard? Yeah, you know, um, one of those things is just, as Josie said, you know, there is, there is nothing like college athletics, nothing in the world. Like I'm telling you, like college athletics in the United States is, is a whole new beast. Um, we, we trained and, 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 and college athletics in general, I, I know in the game of soccer, so I'll just speak to that. But, but I think all, all, all college athletics, we in the United States, we train ourselves um, to, to be the most physical players in the world, you know, and, and that shows. And sometimes to our own detriment because we're not as skilled as other countries, especially in the game of soccer. If anybody's watched the World Cup, you know that that might be the case. Um, but we, we, we're going to work harder than anybody else. And I can tell you that college athletes work harder than professional athletes. Like that, is, that has been my experience 100%. And, um, and so as Josie said, like I, I couldn't believe like after like preseason, and, like during preseason after two days, I'd be going in the morning and we would have, you know, fitness in the morning, thinking that I couldn't get through that fitness. And then when I got through that fitness, I would think there's no way that I'm supposed to be back here in like five hours to do something again. Like I, I, I couldn't believe that there's no way. And then you'd wake up, you eat and you wake up from a nap and you'd go back out and, and, and they would push you to the max again. And, and you would realize that, that there's, there's really no limits. And you would, you'd realize that like physically your, your body can do way more than, than you ever expected. And, um, and that, that just stuck with me my whole life. I knew that I was capable of so much more. I, I, you know, I, I don't think I could be a Navy SEAL, but when I look at those guys, uh, and not to take anything from Army Rangers, my brother, but when I look at, at, at those guys, I'm like, there's, there's just no way. And then, then my next thought is, yeah, yeah, actually there is. Like, those dudes are, are, are just pushing themselves to the max, and there's always more in the tank. There's, there's always more to give. Um, but, um, you know, in the, in the spiritual life, as Joe said, there, there's something about discipline, but there's also something about perseverance. We go through so much in, in, in the spiritual life, especially in our church right now. We got to remember um, we're dealing with things, you know, physically being separated from the sacraments right now during this, this, this pandemic. Like we're physically separated. Right. But also that, that entails like a lot of emotional separation, too. And, and there, there's things that are people are, are dealing with emotionally right now that, that I've experienced in my ministry that 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 makes that, that compound that issue. And then then you think about, you know, being being spiritually absent and and um, and, and then dealing with with life on top of that and, 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 and mentally and, and intellectually. There's there's so many levels of this. And. And we realize that, that all of that is held together by this spiritual life. And, and we have to come together and, and, and realize that the Lord is calling us uh, to something that we are capable of. And so many times we want to we give up. We want to give up on, 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 on the spiritual life because it's, it's so intangible at times where it seems that way. It seems like there's no more in the tank. It seems like no one's answering. It seems like no one's home. 
you know, but, but at that time we realized that, that there is more. And when anything physically, emotionally, it, intellectually is taken away, that's our truest strength. Our best strength in the entire world is spiritual strength. It is, it is stronger than anything else, right? I have a, a, a priest brother who, who was um, a weightlifting champion in high school. And um, he came home one day and told his father that, um, that he had won this, this tournament and he was the strongest, strongest man in the state of Illinois. And his father, just, just a devout Catholic, just lowered his newspaper and looked him in the eyes and he says, physical strength is the lowest form of strength. And then he just put his newspaper back up and kept reading, right? To, to instill in him, like, son, if you get your spiritual life right, you're going to know a strength that you'll, you've never known before, right? And I believe that we can be pushed to spiritual heights that we've not known. And sometimes we walk into the chapel for five minutes and we say, it's just not happening for me. I, I guess the Lord doesn't love me. I guess, you know, this isn't just going to work for me. Maybe I shouldn't be Catholic. Maybe I shouldn't continue. And, and yeah, we got to persevere. There's more in the tank. There's more to go. And, and, it, and that strength that we can have spiritually is what can make us, make us the greatest witness, which is, this is the word for martyrs, right? So it could, it could actually make us martyrs. That's how the martyrs endured. That is awesome. No, you know, that's, that's so timely with something that I actually wrote a little reflection today that I sent to, to some people that I think is going to be a future blog post is just like the, uh, you know, how often you hear in basketball, you know, this, like when you're having an off day and you just encourage somebody, you just say, you know, just keep shooting, you know, yeah. keep shooting. And, and the, the kind of the mindset behind that that I had is like, you know, when you're, when you're in the midst of something and things just aren't going well, you feel cold and you're not getting the responses, you're not seeing the results that you want, that, but you know that something works, you know, especially in your prayer life. You know that prayer, you know, it nourishes your soul and it brings you closer to God. We know that fitness is the same way, right? Working out, we find ourselves in these difficult times and all this change and quarantine and the stress and anxiety that we see on TV and on social media all day long. And it's easy to stop those things that we know work, you know, like we lose our game plan and we lose sight of the things that God's calling us to just because the context has changed or the circumstances have changed. But the right. circumstances don't have to dictate our actions. They don't have to dictate who we become and what we, what we are, you know, who we are. And so, you know, just thinking about that, like keep shooting mentality and, and having somebody to tell me that, you know, in the midst of the times where I was low on confidence and I was, you know, obviously off and not feeling it. It felt like I was shooting, you know, with two left hands or like my hands were broken or whatever, you know, it's like you couldn't throw a rock in the ocean and you're like, if people are telling you keep shooting, sometimes you're like, man, are you sure? Are you really good? <laughs> And that's how it feels, though, sometimes. It's like, is God even hearing my prayers? You know, like, is this even, am I wasting my time? Am I wasting my breath? Sending these prayers up to God. Uh, I think that's, yeah, so important, the, the perseverance aspect of it. Love how you hit on the desolation and stuff. But, Josie, I had one for you from what you shared uh, in regards to discipline. You know, you said that holiness mm -hmm. is discipline. What for you, like, how do you feel like, um, this is kind of a two-part question, is how do you feel like you developed the discipline that you eventually got to? And then also, how has that discipline now carried over in your life post tennis? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think like anything, discipline is a habit that's, you know, with good habits, you develop discipline. Um, and for me, just being so goal oriented with tennis, I think every day that like I would go to practice, you know, I knew my, my big lofty goal was to play professional tennis. And I knew in order to do that, I needed to do this, this, and this. So like every day I was motivated by those things. So even if I'm tired in the third practice of the day, I'm going to give 110% because I want to get to where I want to go. Um, and it's the same in, I think, the spiritual life in the sense that, okay, we want to be saints. Like how, how do we be saints and get to heaven? Like, okay, well, God gives us a pretty clear idea of like what we should do. We, we also have other holy men and women and saints who have walked before us who have showed us how to live. Um, and like, what are those tangible steps you can take each day to get there? Um, so really it's like, I feel like discipline is developed and, um, and I think keeping those smaller goals in mind and like steps to get there makes it kind of tangible, uh, to like take those baby steps, I guess, to where you want to get, whether it's in athletics or in the spiritual life. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know your second question was, uh, how to translate to after tennis, but I think that kind of answers that too, in the sense that I think discipline carries over to all areas of life so um for me it's like I like to look at like areas that I need to work on and um you know develop little like goals or whatever you want to call them like oh I need to work on silence well 
this week I'm going to try to make a holy hour or, um, you know, I don't, I'm not good at reading scripture or I don't enjoy that. Well, I'm going to make myself do that like every morning for five minutes, you know? So it's, it's getting those tangible, yeah, it's making it practical, I think, because sometimes you have those big lofty goals, but you don't know how to get there. So you need, you need to put some practical steps in there. Absolutely. I think that was exactly what I was hoping you'd share. It's just the, you know, the fact that discipline in one area of life carries over to every other area. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever you grow in discipline, you grow in discipline, whether that's, yeah. you, you know, disciplining yourself with your diet or with your spending or in your prayer life, like it th then translates into all these different areas, uh, which is so huge. You know, I feel like people really, really seldom understand the weight of that and the, the strength that that can have as you start to develop that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. It's awesome. Yeah. Oh, Chase, <laughs> so this, one, this next one I got for you, man, is like, you know, you're a stud athlete. You're obviously a smart guy. Like, I doubt you were pulling D's in school. You're this good looking, you know, it's got to be tough for you. Just having all this going for you. How did you start to find your identity in God and your relationship with God as opposed to attaching so much of your identity into your accolades or your success or your soccer success or whatever it was that you were kind of outwardly producing? How did you start to develop that identity as a son of God? Um, and what was that journey kind of like for you? So, you know, it was one of those things that, um, you know, as you say that, it just, it even feels foreign to me a little bit too. I, I don't know. I never believed, you know, all this hype that, that you know, I'm, I'm a big star or, or anything like that. You know, I always felt a little bit out of place, honestly, as, as, a, as an important athlete, even playing in Division One soccer. And, um, you know, thinking that, that we were, you know, one of the best teams in the country. And, 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 and even that felt like, you know, I was a little bit out of place. You know, I, I never felt like I really deserved to, to, to have, you know, that kind of success. I was, I was just a, a normal kid from, from central Illinois, you know, in the Midwest and, and uh, came from humble upbringings. And, and, um, and so, I don't know, I guess I just never really believed the hype too much. I know we always tell kids, especially like you gotta, you gotta believe it. You gotta, you gotta live this thing. Um, but you know, I guess again, just having that that, that humility that comes from um, parents who who told us that that everything that we had was a gift, you know. And I think that's 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 where um, that, that gift of of finding your identity comes from. That everything that I have is given. That means that I, I didn't necessarily earn all of this stuff. That, that means that I was, you know, I, I, I was given good genes. There were guys that, that may have worked harder than me, you know, even in high school, you know, but, but like, I, I don't know, I was, I was chosen for this for a purpose. And I know now that I was chosen for this so that I could be a witness uh, to so many, to be on a platform, even like, even like this podcast right now, like you would not have called me if I was not an athlete. I know that the Lord is, is, is using this and he uses so many different people in different ways and, and because of their backgrounds. Um, and, and I know that um, I, I was chosen to even go to Chile to find my vocation. Like it was not even about soccer. Like I look back on that hindsight's 2020, I know. But as I look back on that, I realize like soccer was so secondary to what I was doing there. Like most of the time I was not playing soccer. As I told you, I was, that was two hours a day. And the rest of my life, you know, while I was down there was, was, was considering the Lord on my heart and, and what he was doing in my life. And that doesn't make me pious. Uh, I certainly wasn't. And I was struggling to live a good, as a good Catholic man should live. But um, at that time I was, I was really considering what he was doing in my life and always realizing that he was the Lord of my life and I was not. I, I, and I, I, always, I always understood that. And I, I always understood that, that sports were going to end someday. So I never put all of my eggs in that basket, never thought that I was, I was somebody that I wasn't or, or, or too important for, for other people. And, and, uh, and so I, I'm not saying, you know, obviously the moment you say you're humble, you're not, right? And that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not even saying that I was humble. I'm just saying that um, my, my family and my upbringing and my, my relationship with the Lord gave me the perspective to know that that wasn't who I was. That wasn't my true identity as much as, as much as I at times struggle with that. Um, but, um, certainly, um, not believing in that and, and, and realizing that, that the Lord's plan for my life would always be better than my own. And, and, and that was proven to me, you know, the moment that I realized that my dreams would never fulfill me. And, uh, and that, that, that felt helpless for a moment. And then it felt like, it felt like it was exactly who I was made to be to, to follow the Lord and his call for my life. 
That's big. And, and just to just to be clear, you know, well, first of all, I, you know, I love that. I love the the whole story there. That was amazing. Uh, but just to be clear, you just would have been on a different topic. You know, you still would have been, you still would have been on, we still would have had you on here for all the athletes. You just would have had a different topic. We obviously would have had you for the athletes, but, but you still would have been on here. I just want to put that out there, you know. I mean, I would have played tennis or something. I mean, I could have won a national exactly. championship. Or you know, I don't know. I mean. I've seen you hoop, you know. I've seen you hoop. Like you could have easily could have gone D two basketball. Easily could have gone D two basketball. Uh, yeah, no. Fight the despite the despite the vertical challenges. You still easily D two D two quality. No, yeah, no. That's really good. I think it's so important. But uh, Josie, I know you shared a little bit about that too. Just kind of being a part of your story, especially like what was it like? How do you go from you know your whole life, especially with tennis? Like I mean, you were like immersed. You know, you said like from eleven over a decade of your life, like tennis is everything. And you're Josie, especially in your family, like you're the tennis player, right? Like you're Josie, the tennis player. Like that's who yep. you are. You know, how do you step out of that into anything else and like still kind of carry on any type of identity or like, you know, finding your image and all that stuff? Like how did that, how did that look for you? Yeah. Um, honestly, it's, it, yeah, the hardest thing I've ever had to go through, but um, also the most grace filled because I think that you know, as Father Chase shared, he uses all of us as instruments, and he was definitely working in my life in different ways. And I think that the big challenge with identity is we can know that, like, our identity is in Christ, and um, yes, like, we're not defined by what we do, but the reality of it is, like, where where are we spending most of our time throughout the day? Like we're probably going to be tempted to put our identity into that. And for me, that was, that was tennis. Um, it was also like in school or whatever else it was. Like I wanted to get wrapped up into my results because I wanted to be able to control, um, you know, how good I was or the grade I got. Right. Um, and so like it really comes back to I think in college midway through college I realized that like I really struggled with that because when I was performing really really well I um, was super confident and feeling great about myself whatever but then if I went through a rough patch like I would feel terrible um, like my confidence would go down and it just like mentally wasn't great and like if your identity is in something stable, like it shouldn't be like that. Right. Um, and I realized that like, if my confidence was truly in Christ, like I wouldn't be up and down like that. And so, um, I kind of made like that realization in college and realized that, okay, if I'm going to pursue this dream of tennis, like I need to really, really focus on my prayer life because I need to be rooted in that first in order to have my identity locked in to Christ. Um, because the, the reality is you spend time with like where you spend your time is where you find your identity, I think. And, um, you know, love, I've, I've heard it said before that like love is spelled time. So you spend time with things that you love. So if you love the Lord, like you're going to spend time with him. And I realized that like, I was not like, even though I said he was my number one priority, like, was it really showing through my habits? Um, or like, was I practicing four hours a day and giving maybe like 10 minutes to God before I went to bed. Um, so I really recommitted to prayer and truly like diving into that because I realized he was the only one who could tell me who I was as his daughter, as his beloved. And, um, and for me to believe those words, I needed to have him tell me and have that personal relationship with him so I could hear his words speak into my heart. Um, but honestly, it is an everyday battle because even after like walking away from tennis, um, you know, leaving that behind and my life switches 180, um, it was, it was really hard at first because here I am at a job, like I'm known as the, you know, a tennis player. I like, I, to be honest, like I liked being known as like, a tennis player who had accomplished a lot in a professional tennis player. Like that sounds really yeah. cool. Right. Um, but like there I was like at a desk job that like, honestly, I could be replaced tomorrow and somebody could do the job just as good. And that's humbling. And um, it was just, I mean, it's what, it's what I needed and what I think my spiritual life needed, but um, it's, yeah, it's really, it's really tough. But I think just being rooted in prayer has really, really helped me as I, you know, struggle to, it's an everyday battle, I guess, is what I'm saying with identity and putting it in Christ and rooting yourself in prayer. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's so it's so interesting to me, even as I like talk about you two, right? So I've told so many people about tonight and just talking about you guys. Like there's there's like a part of me who almost like I feel like I'm shortchanging people by just talking about what you've accomplished athletically, you know, just like talking about that. You know, I'm just like, yeah, like Josie did this in tennis, but like she also does this awesome ministry, and all that, you know, because like I'm more focused now on both of you and what you do in ministry, Josie, and what you're doing now as a priest. Uh, Father Chase and, and so like for me knowing you both so you know so much more now it's like I'm almost like yeah you know like, they did this cool sports stuff but like you just gotta hear from them you know like I just there's no way for me to express like the desire that I have for people to really get to know you guys and yeah. your commitment to the Lord and to the work that you're doing uh, yeah it's just awesome but it's so interesting that identity thing I think and just like how we describe ourselves how we describe other people you know like how what do we really value about others and about ourselves and how, how important is our resume and where we went to school and all that different stuff uh, it impacts so much. Father Chase, do you have anything you wanted to add there? You know, just as, as the three of us were, were, were chatting, you know, the other day, you know, um, I, I talked that I mentioned that I like to give athletes is, is who are you when the Jersey comes off, mm -hmm. you know, just to think about that. Like, I mean, even you as, as an, as an army ranger, whatever, like how, who are you when that uniform comes off? Because really, when we engage in athletics, like we, we own it, right? Like, like you no, it doesn't matter if you are nine years old or if you're a high school athlete, you're a college athlete, you're a professional athlete, like, like we own it. We own that identity. And, and there's something that that's so real about that. And so um, it, it's hard. It's hard no matter when we, we stop that thing because we've identified so much with what we do that um, it, it's hard to, to, to realize that that that's not who we are anymore. Right. And it's it's really if we're smart, it's not who we've ever been. It's just it's just something, an aspect of our life that helped in our formation to get to who we are. Right. I don't want to downplay, you know, the role that, that sports played in my life. Like it formed me like like soccer formed me. And, and the, the lessons that I learned there for me, John Paul II, you know, he he said something, the most profound thing that I've ever heard in sports. I know Josie likes Paul the sixth, but uh, John, John Paul II said, you know, that sports are the school of moral virtue. They're the school of moral, like, like it's supposed to be a school. It's not supposed to be the ending point. It's not heaven. It's, it's not the place where you belong. It's not home, right? School, it's a school, right? And so it, what he meant by that is that athletes every single day, they, just by going onto the practice field every single day, you're, think about all the disciplines and, and, and all of the virtues that you're learning, right? You're, you're learning discipline. You're, you're learning teamwork. You're learning sacrifice. You're learning that, that, that the team is bigger than the individual. You're learning how to win with class. You're learning how to lose with class. You're, you're, you're learning so many different things. And all of those things, as John Paul II would describe, are directly relatable to the Christian life, right? We have to learn that the church is bigger than one person. That's bigger than me. It's, it's, the family is bigger than me, right? Everything about my life is, is bigger than who I am. And I have to learn to, to, to deal with my failures with class, to deal with my successes with class, uh, to, to learn to sacrifice for others who are around me, to learn to mortify myself for, the, for, for, for my salvation and for the salvation of the world, right? So there's so many things that are, that are going on in sports that, that help us to, to realize that this isn't our true identity. It's just a school. It's just a school. And so when we take that jersey off for the final time, um, that's difficult for all of us, no matter what. Even if we haven't, I haven't identified with the sport as, as, as who we are, it's, it's always difficult. So if there's anybody listening tonight, you're like, man, I feel like such a loser because I, I was just a, you know, I was an eighth grade standout. And that was where I ended my career. And I'm still holding on to something like, seriously, I get you. Like, I understand that and don't downplay that. And you got to deal with that and don't, don't hide that away as if, as if that doesn't hurt, you know, that you didn't get to play in high school or if you played in high school, you didn't get to play in college or, you know, it just keeps going, but just deal with that and understand that and recognize for, for what it was. Maybe that formed you in a way that helped you to be the man or the woman that you are today. And, and we should, we should be good interpreters of those virtues right? Interpret how that, how that virtue can now be uh, a transformable virtue for, for the rest of your life. So, you know, we keep talking about uh, identity and, and, and recognizing who we are, um, but let's recognize the good of sports. Let's recognize the, the, the place that they played in our life and, and be able to be okay with that so that we can now be okay with moving away from it and recognizing that I'm, I'm okay without soccer. I'm okay without tennis. I'm okay without eighth grade basketball where I excelled, you know, like that's, that was the highlight of my career, but you know, now we've, we've moved on and, and I'm a man 
and I'm a, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And, and that's my identity. And I, I don't need anything more than that to validate who I am as a man. That's baller. <laughs> that's great. No, you know, I mean, you hit on so many things there. The, the thing I, I really want to focus on that you talked about was just that, that Pope St. John Paul II quote about it being the, the training ground for moral virtue, you know, like uh, one thing that I really loved about competing with Father Chase, I know, Josie, you shared a little bit about the emotions that you feel while competing. Uh, and I've never gotten to see you in action, unfortunately. So maybe I'll get to see some old tapes someday. Uh, Father Chase, I got to play you in basketball, you know, and one thing I always really respected about you was like, um, well, one thing, one thing I think a lot of people don't realize is that seminarians and priests, like you guys are human beings. Like your heart still beats, you know, you still have blood within you. You, you, you breathe, you know, you blink. Some, you got to eat a few times a day. Um, yeah, like all that normal human stuff. So you also have emotions, you know. And I think it was always so surprising to students at the Mount that you guys sometimes express those emotions. <laughs> sometimes not very well, you know. And yeah, it was right. like, People, and, and I got the same thing, you know, as a Bible study leader and just like a spiritual leader on campus of like, oh, you can't act like that. Or like, how could you do that? And it's like, dude, like, I agree. You know, when I stepped out, I was wrong. It's like, yo, I agree that I should have done that. But like, you can't put this standard on me that's like unattainable. Um, but you, I mean, you did a great job. Like you, I'm not going to say you were flawless. I don't remember personally any times that you really, you know, stepped out of your character during competition. Obviously, if you play pro sports and maybe intramural sports, it's a little bit easier to not take it seriously. But uh, for you guys, like, what was that like, you know, just kind of growing in? Because I know for me, I had a huge journey in that playing basketball. Like, I, I was a guy who chewed out my teammates, was, like, very downgrading, very, you know, and it ebbed and flowed throughout my life of playing basketball. Like, there was times where I was really good, times where I was really bad. Um, but for you guys, like, what was that journey like of really, you know, you guys always had your faith while playing sports. Like, how did you, you know, maintain your character despite, like, you know, people like wanting to swing at somebody on the soccer field or just like, you know, you're having a bad day in tennis or maybe the opponent or the, you know, the line judge, like somebody's pissing you off. Like, how do you, you know, still still be a good human being in the midst of these, you know, these hot and difficult moments? Whichever one of you wants to take that. Yeah, I guess, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty an even keeled competitor. Um, I'd actually say I'm like a happy competitor, which is weird. I'm that annoying person that like doesn't show negative emotion when I play. No, my like teammates would call me like the energizer bunny because I was just always like energizing everybody around me. But um, no, I mean, not to say that like I wouldn't get mad. Like, of course, like if my, if my opponent was like, just making me super upset or the line judge called it like of course I'm mad but I never wanted to give my opponent the satisfaction of seeing me mad or upset um like that would bother me more than like keeping it in if that makes sense um so I yeah I was able to control it pretty well and just like I mean obviously I'd show like positive emotion but um, I realize that that might just be my personality as a competitor, um, and most people are not like that. Um, but then also just like handling, I think mistakes emotionally. I had to learn to um, kind of like laugh off mistakes because unless I would like focus on them too much or like get too upset inwardly. <clears throat> um, so I would say like my battle was mainly like inside me because I didn't. I tried not to like show too much outside. Um, so yeah, it was kind of like a mental game, if that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's incredible to hear. I think uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not easy to do that. So I mean, it's super impressive, but that's uh, really awesome. So Father Chase, if you would like talk to me about what that what that journey was like for you, um, you know, and just kind of growing in that, but also like tell us, you know, like relate to the people who don't know that like you as a priest still have, like even today, like you still get mad you know like you still have people or moments or whatever you know that like frustrates you and you experience the full range of human emotion you know uh yeah. well you never stop being human you never stop being human and 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 of course we've seen that in the worst ways in our church and i don't mean to highlight those things um but l let's be honest like like there there is humanity that is still at play and that's why it's so important as josie said to discipline ourselves like we we have to be disciplined human beings we have to be witnesses and that you know, I, I always wanted to be a role model for people. I, I, I looked up to athletes so much when I was little, so much, um, so much. And I, I'll tell you that like Michael Jordan, as I mentioned before, he was, he was my hero. He was my hero on the court. And I can tell you today 
that I've, um, and I don't think Michael Jordan's listening and it's probably good, but I'll just say like, I've, I've never been so disappointed as an adult looking at Michael Jordan, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's not because and I always uphold him, even, even when we have, you know, when we talk about the GOAT, you know, if they want to get into a, a brawl about LeBron or, or Kobe or, or Michael or whatever, like I'll, I'll defend Michael to, to the end, to the end, right? You're not going to argue with me about that. But at the same time, like, like Michael, uh, just, you know, the way that he transitioned into retirement and, and, the, and the way that he lives and even watching the last dance, like I just, it's, it's, not, it's not him anymore. And there, there's something about that. And so I just realized that like athletes serve a purpose. And Michael Jordan, I'll say, I, I thank him. He served a purpose for me. He inspired me. Right. But I, I, unfortunately now, like my role models are some of the saints. Right. I, I, I've moved on and, and I don't need Michael in my life anymore. But um, but just, just seeing that, I, I realized that role models were so important to me growing up, so important. And, and I, they, they inspired me. They wanted me. They made, they made me want to be better. And, and now I always realized that I, I wanted to be a role model for others. You know, and so I always kept that in mind. And what, 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 what does that look like? And what should I look like if I wanted to be, you know, a hero of, of, of someone that was younger than me or, or even someone that, that wasn't younger than me? That just, just someone to look up to, someone to inspire, someone that would help them live a better life. And um, so, you know, the things that I struggled with, you know, emotionally and, and humanly, especially on the field, um, there were two things. One were um, when someone didn't give their best effort right? It wasn't people messing up. I can, I can deal with people messing up all day long, right? If you just, if your skill is lacking, like I can deal with that because I can look at you and just say, you have no capacity to do better than what you're doing right now, right? I can live with that, even if that's a harsh reality and you're my teammate. But I have a problem if you mess up and you didn't, you didn't cover your mistake, if you didn't run back, if you didn't hustle, if you, if you weren't back and, and, and getting back in the game and helping us cover your mistake, right? I got a problem with that. And that's where I would show my emotion. My other place where I would show my emotion, the second place was I was, I was very hard on myself. We say that, that, that we are our harshest critics. We're our own harshest critics. And, and that was certainly the case with me. And, and that was probably my greatest struggle is I would get down on myself, you know? And, and a lot of that has to do with pride and, and, and the way that we shame ourselves in sports, right? There's that embarrassment when I mess up. You know, I think that it looks bad. Like I, I look bad as a man, as a person. And, and that's the difference between guilt and shame is that, is that I put it on my person. Like I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a, a, a good enough man for this team. I'm not a good enough uh, athlete. I'm not a good enough teammate. And all of a sudden I look at myself in different eyes. And, and that's where I, I struggled a lot was, was uh, either getting down on someone else's effort or, or, or getting down on myself for my own mistakes. But, um, you know, just uh, uh, again, maybe we can talk about the remedies of that. Maybe there's not enough time. But. The reality is that, um, yeah, there's, there's human emotion that goes along with that. And we recognize that, that there's, always, there's always ways to, to, to remedy um, those emotions. And there's, there's ways to, to bounce back. And, and there's always another game. You know, I'm, my buddies at Clemson, we always used to say, you're only as good as your last game, right? Mm -hmm. which, which always kept our, our mental energy in the next thing, right? It didn't matter whether you, whether you played terrible last game mm -hmm. or whether you won the last game because you're only as good as the game that's, that's coming next. So we always were focused. It didn't matter. The last game didn't matter. You're only as good as, as, as the next game you're playing, the last game that you played. And that's the only thing that mattered. You could be undefeated, but you're only as good as that last loss or that last win. And, and now we carry that into the next game. So your, your, your mind always has to be, it has to be in the present. That's amazing. Yeah, no, that's really, really good. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah. I mean, there's so much there. I think uh, the, the, I think one of the biggest things you highlighted there for a lot of people is just the difference between guilt and shame, you know, and, and the way that we kind of approach that and look at that, because it's so interesting. One of my like least favorite cliches of like modern day Americans is like, you should live a life with no regrets, you know? And it's like, it's good. It's healthy to feel guilty when you've done something. Yeah, man. Yeah. Like you should feel like you should feel some type of guilt or regret when, I mean, like, unless you're not sinning, which is, you know, is impossible. Like you should have some form of regrets and you're like, yeah, there's some things you should yeah. wish, you know, I wouldn't have done things that way if I could go back and, you know, redo right. my life. Uh, and I, you know, all of us can think of like many things like that, but just this idea that you should live like just, you know, just the, with the desire, I think some people have good intentions, the desire to rid people of shame. They've also pushed out guilt, you know, and well yeah. conscious and a well-formed conscious is going to help you to anticipate the guilt, but also experience it. And like, I mean, something for me is I dealt with serious sin, you know, or I deal with serious sin in my own life. Like, I have to like allow myself to feel it. Like I don't even run from it sometimes. Yeah. You know, sometimes like I, you know, you do something, or you talk to somebody some way, and you just like, 
you don't want to sit in there for too long, but it's just like any type of punishment, you know, you're like, you gotta like, why did you do that, man? You know, I don't like over, you know, you want to overdrive it, but it's like, feel the pain of this. Like, why did I, you know, treat this person that way? Let's dig. Cause that's the only way you can really dig to the root of it. I think, you know, like, what was it that made me talk to that person disrespectfully? And like, what was actually going on? What was the cause? Yeah. What have changed it? You can't go and get to the answers to those questions unless you're willing to go deep and, and kind of find, you know, and bear the burden of the guilt to go in deep enough to really kind of dig out that, that answer, uh, which is big. So, no, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I mean, you brought up another question in there that I'm really excited to ask Josie. Josie, are you Jordan or LeBron for the GOAT? That's that, this, <laughs> this, this is the question oh, right now. You get and one Josie, shot, Josie. You get one shot. Josie. Say, before you came on, we were discussing this, and I was telling Nathan how I don't like Jordan or LeBron. So. <laughs> you believe that? Um, no, but if I had to pick one, I think I'd pick Jordan over LeBron. New Year's. Yeah. yeah. Only slightly disappointed. All I'm gonna say is, you know, I didn't wear the LeBron USA jersey <laughs> by accident. You know, I mean, this was not a mistake. This is not I did not misdress. But to be fair, I do have a uh, a Jordan, or at least I had a Jordan USA warm up. That was pretty fire too. Dang. But we don't need we can save that for another time. That could be for the after chat. Next time, yeah. <laughs>